Well, it's good to see you here tonight, and I would ask you to please take God's Word and open to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. We're going to look at 2 Samuel. We'll probably, we're going to jump around in 2 Samuel actually tonight on a few passages. We'll start out at uh, chapter 11, and we'll get into this here tonight. Tonight, I want to talk about the truth about consequences. I shared a little bit of this with our men yesterday in our prayer breakfast, and I want to share with you tonight. The last uh, week was a really difficult week for Christianity in that uh, another nationally known pastor uh, had to step down from his church because of uh, an inappropriate relationship that he had. He confessed that to his board and had to step down. This is a man who's nationally known, who's had an impact on a lot of people. He's actually, I read a lot of his books. In fact, when I was away from Tennessee for a few weeks, I had about five of his books with me uh, to read them, and um, I've referred to him often in the past. And uh, he, he was just very, very well known, especially among uh, pastors. Um, he was someone that pastors looked to. And uh, so he had to basically step down. He had to step down out of ministry and, um, and confess that to his board and, uh, and, and just a lot of damage from all of it. And, you know, when I, of course, when I heard the news I, was, news, I was deeply grieved by that, very, very much so. That was my first response. And then the second response is one of fear, the fear of how insidious sin is. And if a, if a man that I regard as a godly man could fall like that, then I need to guard my heart, certainly, and all of us need to guard our heart. It really serves as a warning to all of us about the seriousness of sin. And so I want to just uh, look at the life of David because this is given to us in Scripture as a warning. Uh, for all of us to uh, deal thoroughly with sin in our life and to guard our heart, to keep our heart. Um, now, God does forgive. We are grateful for that. But there's a principle that we need to understand, and we see it in the life of David, and that is simply that, um, that it's the principle of sowing and reaping. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 is the story that records David's adultery with Bathsheba. And in order to cover up his sin, he had Uriah killed in battle. And this is not a pleasant top topic to deal with, but the Bible um, is clear about these kind of things. In fact, you know, when the Bible talks about its heroes, it's very clear not only to talk about their successes, but also their failures. And why does the Bible do that? It, it does it, first of all, to show that they're just men. The, the, the people in Scripture were men or their flesh at best, and uh, just like us. And if, 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 if it could happen to them, it could happen to us. But also it's here to serve as a warning to us so that we will learn from those mistakes. And, and so it, it should stir our hearts to fear, fear God and also fear sin. And so in 2 Samuel, really, it's the account of David's life and of him reaping what he had sown, especially when you get to chapter 13 all the way to chapter 19. Really, it's, it's David reaping some of the things that uh, he had sown in his life. And so this, it's the sad picture of David's grief and misery and a severe mercy from the Lord. Now, when you read these Old Testament narratives, God is always the main character of these narratives. And what we learn about this is that we serve a God who's merciful and forgiving but we also learn that God's forgiveness does not cancel out certain laws. It doesn't cancel out the law of sowing and reaping, all right? If a man is in a skyscraper and decides to jump out, and on the way down he's thinking, you know, this was not a good idea. And then he, on the way down he says, you know, God, this was stupid. I shouldn't have done this. Will you forgive me? And on the way down, can he get forgiveness? Absolutely. God will forgive him. But God's forgiveness doesn't cancel out the law of gravity. He's still going to hit the bottom. He's still going to hit the ground. And it's so as well in the spiritual world. God's forgiveness and mercy is, is such that he gives it to us, he grants it to us because God is forgiving and merciful. But it does not cancel out the, the law of sowing and reaping. There are still consequences that take place when sin enters, or we yield to sin and we allow it to enter into our life. And so this is something to fear. 
Hosea 8, 7 says this, for they, that, they have sown the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. F.B. Meyer wrote this. He said, the greater the man, the dearer the price he pays for a short season of sinful pleasure. And David is certainly no exception to this. And again, this is a principle that should strike fear into our hearts, a, a fear of God and a fear of sin, a desire not to in any way bring disgrace to the name of the Lord it should act as a deterrent for anyone who is tempted to enter into a season of sin and disobedience. And I believe that that's why this is recorded here. This whole uh, narrative in the life of David, I think that's why it's recorded here in Scripture. I think that's why we see in 2 Samuel one tragedy after another, after another, after another in the life of David. It is a warning. I, I, I've told this to men. I've, I've said it to our men yesterday at the prayer breakfast. Listen, if you're ever tempted to enter into a season of sin, you should do this. Of course, no one will do this, but I still suggest it anyway. Sin has a way of making people stupid, to be quite honest with you. But before you do that, just read 2 Samuel. Just, just, just sit down and in one, in, at one sitting, just read through the whole narrative in the life of David. And what you'll find is that if you get to 2 Samuel, you'll get to chapter 1, what you'll find is there's one triumph after another triumph after another. I mean, you know, God gives David victory over his enemies. Uh, David is able to uh, uh, basically t uh, become king, and the people kind of rally around him. And then he's able to make Jerusalem his capital city. He, d he takes the city from the Jebusites, and then he's able to take the ark and move it into the city and the tabernacle there, and it's just one victory after another after another. And by the time you get to chapter 10 of 2 Samuel, you'll think, man, God is just blessing him. I mean, what else is the Lord going to do for this guy? I mean, David has it made. He has it all. But then you get to chapter 11, and you get transgression. You see David's sin. And then the book turns like a, a door on a hinge. You saw triumph after triumph after triumph, and the, bo the book moves upward until you get to transgression in chapter 11, and then it swings, and then what you have is tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, and it just continues out that way. And David's whole life, even though he's the man after God's own heart, even though he's the man that God chose to do great things, that, that doesn't make David uh, exempt from the consequences of sin. And he reaps the consequences of his iniquity. And, and, and the second part of 2 Samuel is just one heartache after another. An infant baby dies. David's son Amnon rapes his ste stepsister Tamar, a brutal, ugly affair. David's son Absalom murders his brother Amnon. Absalom flees, becomes a rebel. He returns, but he's estranged from his father, and he begins to, uh, to mount an insurrection against his father, a plot to assassinate his father and take the kingdom and make it for himself. David has to flee for his life from Jerusalem. God had defeated all David's enemies, but now David is running for his life from his own son, his own son. And then Absalom is killed, and David is told of his son's Absalom death in chapter 18, and David weeps, and there's just so much sorrow and heartbreak and lament. And if you could ask David this question, was it worth it? Was it worth it? His answer would be absolutely not. His, he probably couldn't answer because of the tears, because of the brokenness. His tears really would tell the story. It is the devil's gospel that says you can sin and get away with it. God's hand of blessing was on David for the whole first part of his reign, the whole first part of 2 Samuel, but the hand of God's blessing becomes the heavy hand of God's punishment and judgment on him as the curses that his sin brought far outweigh the fleeting pleasures of that sin itself. And so that's the principle that we learn here about David. So mark it down. In grace, God does forgive all our sin, but he does not remove all the consequences of it. He doesn't re Now, he'll be there to help you with the consequences I mean, when you hit the ground, he'll be there to help pick up the pieces in mercy and to bring healing, but you're still going to hit the ground, and you're still going to have to reap the consequences of it. 
And it's crucial to understand this because it affects both our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. If we don't understand how God deals with us, we will grow angry and withdrawn when he disciplines us. While our God is gracious to forgive when we confess, he will not violate his own holiness by interfering with the tragic results of our sin. And so, with all that in mind, I just want you to see two things tonight, and we'll kind of flip through here. I'll let the Bible just do the talking here. This is a very solemn story here, but here's the first thing you could write down. In grace, God forgives all our sins. That's the good news. God is fully uh, willing and merciful to forgive the penitent sinner, to forgive the person that's truly repentant. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse number 13, God says this to David after he sends Nathan the prophet to him. He says, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Normally the wages of sin is death. If God had followed the the letter of the law, David should have been stoned, but he wasn't. And God forgives David. David will not die there for his sin. Why? Because someone else will die for his sin. David will have a, a greater son who will come one day and who will bear his iniquity who will bear his sin. That greater son, of course, will be Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the death of Jesus on the cross is the reason why God the Father can forgive David's sin, and that's the reason he can forgive our sins. People in the Old Testament were saved the same way we are. They were looking forward to the cross. We look back on it. But it's because of what took place on the cross that God the Father can uh, cover our sins. It's the reason God can put away David's sin, as it says here. God the Father's holiness demands that sin be punished, but God the Father in his mercy allows not us to bear the full brunt of that, but he laid all of our sins upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, after David sinned, he repented, and he confessed his sin to God, and that's where we get Psalm 51, that great psalm of confession where after Nathan comes and he he points to David and he says, you know, you're the man, thou art the man, you've done this. David realizes that his sin is found out, and then he truly repents before the Lord, and he writes down Psalm 51. But there's also another psalm that David wrote on this occasion. He wrote Psalm 51 first after he repented and he confessed his sin. Later on, a little bit later on, he wrote Psalm 32. This was a psalm of contrition as well. So turn there with me real quick. Hold your place in 2 Samuel, we're going to come back to that, but go to Psalm 32 and look down in verse number 1 of Psalm 32. This is a a wonderful psalm. Look at verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, the Apostle Paul will later quote from these first two verses in this psalm in Romans 4 as he writes about the great doctrine of justification. And David here in these two verses is expressing his joy over God's forgiveness of sin. His sin is covered. His sin is forgiven. In verse 2, it uses the word impute, the Hebrew word here, to reckon or to count on or to keep account of. It's a bookkeeping term. It's the term that Paul really seizes upon when he talks about the doctrine of justification in Romans 4. When we put our faith in the finished work of Christ, God declares us not guilty. He does not impute our sins to us because Jesus took all of our sins upon himself. So those sins are erased from our record. All future sins are not imputed to us. All of our sins were placed on Christ. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. It's not put on our, on our account. God doesn't impute it to us. And why doesn't he do it? Christ, because of Christ. He, he looks on Christ and he pardons me for my sins. That's why David said, blessed or blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And so this is a song of the blessing of forgiveness. David had God's forgiveness. He talks about cleansing. Look down in verse number 5 where it says this, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and I 
and my iniquity have I not hid? I said, I will confess my transgressions on the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And the form of the sentence emphasizes the immediateness of pardon. The second person pronoun is emphatic. You, God, you forgave me for my iniquity. You forgave me immediately. When I brought it to you, you forgave me immediately. He didn't say, I think you forgave me or I hope you forgave me. No, God forgave him. Such is the mercy and the grace of God. Sometimes I hear Christians say, you know, I, I confess my sin to the Lord. I confess it a thousand times because they wonder if God forgave him. And I, I normally say, look, confess it to God once and then praise him a thousand times that he did forgive you. Because if you bring your sins to God and you confess them, he will forgive. You don't have to wonder. But then there's cleansing, then there's communion. Look in verse number six. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. That, that's, that's wonderful, isn't it? You ever pray and can't seem to find God in prayer? You feel like his presence isn't there. Your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. When you come to God, honest and transparent about your sin, penitent and ready to confess, guess what? You'll always be able to find him. He can always be found to the broken sinner. God is always easy to find when you're honest before the Lord. When you uncover your sins before God in brokenness and in repentance, God in his mercy will cover them up. He's not hard to find in that time. You experience the presence of God in a new way. There's an incredible intimacy that will take place as a result of that. But then not only communion but confidence. Look again in verse number 6 where it says this at the latter part, when thou mayest be found, surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. What is David referring to here when he talks about the waters of God, of the, the flood of waters? He's talking about the waters of God's judgment. That is a poetic metaphor that talks about being able to stand confident before God one day in the judgment, not fearing the, the water of judgment because you know that your sins have already been forgiven. So you can be confident when the flood of judgment comes. He who seeks God when he's found, when you're confessing your sins and you're penitent before the Lord, will not be swept away in the time of judgment. That's the whole point that he's making there. The waters of judgment will not reach you if you have truly repented before the Lord. That's why in verse number 7, thou art my what? Hiding place. That's the place to go to hide. When you need forgiveness, when you're broken, when you've sinned, uh, you need to run to God. You know, sometimes people will say, when I'm dealing with people that have maybe failed and they're bearing the guilt of a sin in their life, and, and they'll say something like, you know, I, I just failed the Lord so miserably. I know God is angry. I know he doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want me right now. He, he doesn't want, I, you know, the last thing I need to do is, you know, seek after the Lord. You know, surely God is angry. He doesn't want me right now. Oh, how wrong you are. The place that you need to run to is God at that point. He's, he's waiting for you. In fact, that's the only place you can go to truly hide. Thou art my hiding place. God, you are my hiding place. Just as the waters of judgment could not reach Noah and his family because they were safely hidden in the ark, when you're, you, you repent of your sin and you run to God, you, you're hidden in him, then the waters of judgment will not reach you either. I love the, the words, one of my favorite hymns written by Charles Wesley, Jesus, a lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearest waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O my Savior, hide, till the storms of life is past. Safe into thy haven guide, O receive my soul at last. Such beautiful words. God is a place where we can run to and be safe and be forgiven and hide in him. But also counsel is the next thing I see here. Look down at verse number eight. I will instruct thee. And teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. 
And these verses are written as if God himself is speaking directly to the person who's been honest and who has confessed their sin and has been restored. Here's God speaking to the penitent sinner, the sinner that ran to him to hide, to hide in him. What is God going to do? God's going to speak intimately to that person, and he's going to guide them. He's going to help them through this. He will guide you. Notice he said, with mine eye. In order for God to guide you with his eyes, it means you have to be seeking his what? You have to be seeking his face, right? This is all beautiful poetic expressions that talks about the intense desire to seek God, to run to him. We look into his face. We look into his eyes. And a person who is clear of conscience can look into his eyes. You know, I remember when I pastored a church going through seminary, I had a lady in our church. We called her Judge Jackie because she was a, a local judge. She was an elderly woman. She had a lot of spunk. And uh, she would say to me sometimes, she would say, Preacher, when those young men stand before me in my courtroom, I tell them, look me in the eye. You look me in the eye. And she said, Preacher, if I can get them to look me in the eye, I can tell whether or not they were lying. She said, it works every time. You know, look me in the eye is what she would say. You know, have you ever watched the eyes of a disobedient child? Where do they look? Anywhere but to their parents' eyes. If you're guilty, you don't want to look at someone in their face. Guilt makes us look everywhere else but to the person to whom we are accountable. In much the same way, we are not directable by, if we're not directable by the eyes of God, it's because we're not looking to him because we're disobedient. But when we confess our sins and when we get forgiveness, we can run to God and we can hide in God and we can look at him with a clear conscience now that our sins are forgiven and that God has cleansed us. And not only that, there's a new communion that God will have with us. And not only that, he will guide us. He'll tell us what to do next. That's, that's part of the beauty and the mercy and the grace of the forgiveness of Almighty God to any penitent sinner. But there's a second side of this. In grace, God does not remove all the consequences. In grace, God will forgive. God will cleanse. But in grace, God does not remove all the consequences. We need to understand that this is just as much a part of God's grace as his forgiveness. It might not sound like that. But it is. If God forgave and also wiped out all the consequences of our sin, you know what? We would never really learn the seriousness of sin. We would go out and just sin all the more without, you know, if there's, there, there's no consequences, there's no uh, reproach, there's no rebuke from what we've done, there's no chastisement, there's no sense of, you know, feeling the weight of what we've done then that person has a, the freedom to just go out and do that same thing all over again. That's why, parents, we need to be careful not to shield our children from the consequences of their actions. Yeah, help them out. Yeah, forgive them. But let, but let them feel the consequences for what they've done because that serves as a great deterrent. People that feel no consequences will not learn to fear God. We would not apprehend his righteousness, nor would we ever feel the need to do so, to see that. So notice in chapter 12, we looked in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel already, but look again in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and look at verse number 10 and notice what the Lord says in verse 10, 2 Samuel 12. Now, therefore, the, sw the sword shall never depart from thine house. David is forgiven, yes. He will be forgiven, but the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. And thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives from before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. And before the sun, that's a serious, serious thing here that God is saying to David. God mentions three negative streams of consequences that David will have to drink from. David, your sins are forgiven. You will not die. 
but that doesn't remove the consequences of your action. And here are the, here's the waters you're going to have to drink from. Here are the consequences you're going to have to bear. In verse 10, the sword will never depart from your house. And this, this sword will correspond to the sword David used against Uriah. The sword meant death. Remember when uh, David was trying to cover his sin with Bathsheba, had Uriah, Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, come from the battle and, and told him, you know, go and rest from the battle and his intention was for him to go and spend the night with his wife. And then when you know, Bathsheba had the baby that she was pregnant with, David's child, uh, he could just say, well, it's Uriah's child. He was trying to cover it. But Uriah was more loyal than even David. And Uriah said, I can't go do that while my men are out on the field. And so what did David do? David sent Uriah's death certificate in Uriah's own hand back to the battle. He said, give this to Joab. And told Joab, listen, let, let Go into the heat of the battle, and, and, when the, and when the battle's really hot, withdraw yourself and leave Uriah out there so that he'll die. And, and that's exactly what happened. And because of the sword that David used against Uriah, God said, David, guess what? The sword is not going to depart from your house. That's one stream. But then in verse 11, you know, some shall take your wives from you. In other words, just as David took the wife of Uriah, someone out of David's own house will take his wives. And what David did was in secret, but what God says, God says, what I'm going to do, it's going to be public. And then in verse 12, part of the consequences for David will be public shame. I will do this before all Israel. This is God talking here. And God is directly involved in the punishment here. And, and then also in verse 14, the infant child born to David and Bathsheba will die. Look at verse 14. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. This is one of the worst things about failing the Lord, especially if you're someone that has somewhat of a, uh, an influence that you just give occasion to the world to blaspheme. To, to shame the name of God. And so God says to David, David, this infant child is going to die. And even this is a mercy for if this child would live, this would be a constant reminder of David's sin and shame. It would give the enemies of God a reason to blaspheme. So God mercifully takes that infant, takes him home. Um, and by the way, you know, there are some egg-headed theologians around here that say, you know, they're not really sure what happens to children when they die. That's ridiculous. All you have to do is really read the Bible. Um, no, no, no infant, no baby dies and goes to hell. Um, we have this story here in the Bible. Just this story here alone is enough to show that every child born or every child that dies before the age of accountability goes to be with the Lord. And, and I've read some really brilliant arguments from egg-headed theologians that try to explain that away. It's ridiculous, and it's foolish, and it's a waste of time to do that. And I don't want to get off on this, but um, in the Old Testament, God punished Israel because they were sacrificing their children to the fire, to the god Molech. And God was angry over their evil. And that's why God punished them so severely. So do you think that if God punishes Israel for sacrificing their children to the fire, that God's going to turn around and take an infant baby and throw it into the fire of hell? Does that make any sense to you whatsoever? That's ridiculous to even think about that notion. Now, this baby's in heaven, and this was a mercy of God. But David had sown death, and now David reaps death. And so I just want to, in the time that we have left, which is really not a lot, I, I, I just want to kind of just quickly go through and see the consequences that David reaped as a result of his sin. David had sown death. David reaps death. David had murdered Uriah. Just like the rich man in Nathan's parable needed to restore fourfold the lamb that he had killed, so David would give his four sons in death. And that's what we see here in the story. First, there's the death of this baby in verses 15 to 19. And the Bible says the Lord struck the child, 
Look at verse 15. And Nathan departed into his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David. Notice that Bathsheba is still called Uriah's wife. And it was very sick. And here David prays for the baby to get well, and the baby does not get well. The baby dies. In verses 19 to 22, David heard the servants whispering and knew the child had died. And, but David knew the child was in heaven. How, how do we know that? Well, verse 22 and verse 23, what does he do? Well, uh, he gets up. He was fasting, but now he, he gets up and he cleanses himself and he washes and, you know, and, he, and he's at peace because he knew that child, God had taken that child to heaven. And he says, you know, a man pulled him over and said, you know, you know, why are you acting like this? I mean, when the child was sick, you were, you were really distraught. He said, look, there, I can't bring the child back, but I can go to be with him. I can, go to be, I can go see him. You know, he's talking about heaven, of course. The second thing we see is Absalom murders Amnon. And I don't have time to go through all of the specific verses, but if you look in chapter 13, down in verse 28 and verse 29, what happens? Absalom was angry at Ammon because Ammon raped his sister Tamar. Tamar was Ammon's half-sister, and Absalom plotted how to kill Amnon. One son kills another. And third, Absalom was slain in rebellion against David. We see this in chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. Absalom wasted little time in trying to build a loyal following of people and uh, he openly criticized his father's administration. The Bible says he stole the hearts of the men of Israel in verse number 6 of chapter 15. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel. They came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He was standing there. He would meet the guys coming to the king for judgment. And he would kind of head it off and, and give judgment himself and, and hug the guys and win their hearts over. Why? He was trying to take the kingdom from his father. David has to end up running for his life in chapter... 15 verses 13 and 14, he has to flee from the forces of Absalom. And this all leads up to uh, the, the, the death of Absalom because in chapter 18 verses 14 and 15, Joab uh, kills David's son. Uh, Absalom's in a vulnerable position um, and he's killed in battle. And then I just want you to read these verses. Look in 2 Samuel chapter 18. Look down at verse number 33. David then gets the story of his son's death, verse 33, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber of the gate and wept. And as he went thus, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. He's just filled with grief. So that's a real contrast from the death of the infant because David knew the infant was in heaven, but he didn't have that hope about his son, Absalom. And he was just crushed in his heart. And then this, this happens after David's death. His fourth son, Adonijah, is killed by Solomon because Adonijah tried to usurp the throne that was giving to, given to Solomon. David had sown death. David reaped death in his house. That's the whole point. You reap what you sow. You reap later than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. And, and this is what happened in the life of David. David had sown sexual sin. David reaps sexual sin in his house. The first crop to spring up was Amnon and Tamar, as we already said in chapter 13, where he rapes his half-sister. And, and so that, that takes place. And then the second crop is when Nathan's prophecy about is literally fulfilled. Remember what Nathan said, David, what you did was in secret. There's going to be others that will take your wives and they'll lay with them publicly. This will, this will shame you publicly. And what happens in this story? Well, Absalom, when he's trying to take over his father's kingdom, calls together all of his counselors and says, look, I need to do something to show that I'm in control. David had left Jerusalem. He was running for his life. Absalom was now in control. He said, I need to do something to show that I am in authority. So he brings together all of his counselors and his counselors give him advice. And part of the advice is, look at it for yourself. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 16 real quick. Look at verse number 20. Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, give counsel among you what we should do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, go in into thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred of thy father. 
and, and shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. And so they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And so here is the fulfillment of that prophecy that Nathan gave. He said, David, what you did, you did it in secret. What I'm going to do, it's going to be public. It's going to be an open. And by the way, just a little side note here. Here's another illustration of human responsibility and divine sovereignty. Who did this? Did God do it or did Absalom do it? I mean, God said, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do this not in secret but in public. But then Absalom is the one that did this. So I'm asking you, who did it, God or Absalom? Well, you're all right. Absalom did it, and yet God did it. And yet God didn't force Absalom to do anything. Absalom did what he wanted to do of his own free will and agency, and yet what Absalom chose to do was not to thwart the will of God. It actually fulfilled the will of God. And there's a mystery there that I can't quite figure out. God didn't give Absalom that idea. That was Ahithophel that did that. And Absalom wasn't dragged into the tent, kicking and screaming, saying, no, 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 I don't want to do this. No, he did what exactly what his evil heart wanted to do, and yet what he chose to do was what God ordained would happen, and yet God was not the doer of the sin Absalom was. And it was all part of the judgment of God against David's house for what David did. He had sown sexual sin. He reaped sexual sin. David had sown deceit and betrayal. David reaped deceit and betrayal. Uh, Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. He was David's loyal counselor, but something caused him to turn away against David, and of course, it's what David did to his granddaughter Bathsheba. Uh, David tried to deceive people. Now, here is some of his loyal friends deceiving him. Again, you reap what you sow. And so, there's a price that comes with sin. It's like the old country preacher said, and we've, you've probably heard it many times, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will charge you more than you're willing to pay. And that's certainly true here of David. Sin always carries a price tag. Its consequences are always too severe And you might not have to pay those consequences immediately, but sometime the bill is going to come due. It will come due. Somebody always pays. Somebody always pays. And that in itself should serve as a deterrent for all of us. It should cause fear in our hearts, a fear of God and a fear against sin. There's a story about a little boy who, father was trying to teach him to do right, and every time the little boy did something wrong or sinned, the father would put a nail into the barn door. And uh, after this child grew up in his house years, that whole barn door was filled with nails. And then when something happened to that little boy, he accepted Jesus Christ and he got saved, and he began living for him. And the father, to impress the son about the forgiveness of God, took him to the barn door, and he started taking out all the nails that represented sin until all the nails were gone. And the father saying, that's what happens to your sins. They're all gone. God has forgiven all those sins. And the little boy looked at the door, and he said, is there any way we can fill in all those holes? And the father says, no, the scars will still remain. The scars are still there. They will remain. And again, that's something that we need to think about. And we need to pray for God to give us a holy fear of God, a fear of sin and the damage that it can do in our life, and a holy suspicion of our own self so that we will be diligent to guard our heart, to guard our heart. Let's bow for prayer together. So, Father, uh, we just come before you now, and we... uh, are duly warned by this story in the life of David. And we're, we're humbled and broken before you, Lord. We're humbled by the fact that, Lord, you're such a forgiving God, so gracious and forgiving. And yet, 
we're all so broken over the fact that, Lord, our sins can do so much damage. So, Lord, would you please guard us, help us. Help us, Lord, to be diligent with our own self. Help us, Lord, to, to win the battle against sin on the inside where it dwells. Help us to realize there's no such thing as secret sin, Lord. You see everything. You see everything. And, Lord, let us win that battle on the inside. Let us be able to say with the psalmist, let the words of my mouth, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my redeemer. Lord, help us to live that kind of life, a life open before your eyes that sees everything, that sees all. And, Lord, give us the grace and the strength to stand against the the tides of evil and temptation that are in this world. And, Lord, in this world, we can, we need your help. And we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name.